بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to lessons in fiqh we're still studying the chapter that deals with menstruation and uh, we have hadith number 121 121 بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم narrated by we didn't consider we didn't consider brown meaning muddy colored and yellow discharge after purification from menstruation as anything impure now one simple short note forgive me for saying this but i've noticed nur that every time you read the hadith you say bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim and although calling or or or, or making dhikr the name of mentioning the name of Allah is something that is good. Nevertheless, we have to avoid having uh, uh, something innovated. Now, when do we recite the Quran? We mention Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim only in the beginning of every chapter, with the exception of Surah At-Tawbah. So, 113 places we begin the Quran by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. But whenever I want to recite a verse of the Quran, I do not say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I say immediately, A'udhu Billahi min ash-shaytan ar-Rajim, and recite the Quran. Likewise, in the Hadith, it is not Sunnah to begin reciting the Hadith by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, mainly because the Prophet didn't do it, Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and also because then you may confuse people and saying and, and by seeing you do this, they say, that, well. To read the hadith, you have to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and this is not the case. One would argue and say, then why do you begin every program by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? The answer would be that there is a hadith saying that anything that is begun without mentioning the name of Allah is cut or uh, 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 um, not complete. It's incomplete. So it is uh, uh, the custom of scholars to begin their session with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. But if they're going to begin every single hadith by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, then it is a different story. Anyhow, okay. Umm Atiyah is talking about yellowish and brownish discharge. What is this? Now, bleeding comes, the menstruation comes to a woman. And when the bleeding is over, she's purified which means that she takes a total bath and she prays. The question is, how does a woman know she has been purified? How would she know that she has uh, uh, the tohr? Scholars say there are two ways. One, some women simply are purified by the stoppage of bleeding, of menstruation. Khalas, it's no more. She doesn't see any bleeding and by this she is considered to be tahir other women and this is the majority after the bleeding is over they see a white thread like discharge and they can they can see it and this white thread like uh, uh, discharge is a sign of their purity the minute the woman sees it that she is pure it, it's not mixed with any yellowish or reddish or brownish uh, 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 substance. <clears throat> now, Um, um Atiyah says, may Allah be ple pleased with her, that we did not consider brown, which is muddy colored, and yellow discharges after purification. So, she tells us that if a woman is purified, the bleeding stops, the menstruation stops, and she knows that it's no more. Or she sees the white uh, uh, thread-like discharge. Then the minute she sees this, she takes a total bath and she's able to pray. Some women, a day or two, they get this yellowish or brownish discharge whenever they go to the toilet. So they think that, oops, we may have purified ourselves earlier than we were supposed to. So they used to ask, 
would this be considered to be part of the menstruation? Um Atiyah tells us, no. And this is the rule. If a woman sees her purity, the, if she's purified, if the menstruation ends, whether by the ble stop, uh, stoppage of bleeding or by seeing the white thread, then that is it. She may not be bothered by any yellowish or brownish discharge that comes afterwards. Khalas, it's finished. She may pray and fast as she wishes, and it has nothing to do with uh, uh, her monthly period. But also, one should not be quick to purify uh, herself. And that is why Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, used to tell them that don't rush things. Because women used to show her uh, 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 what they wipe. After wiping, they show her the color. And she would, say, she would see some yellowish or reddish or brownish color before she, they see the purification, before they see the white thread. And she would tell them, do not rush. Do not rush. You're still menstruating until you see purity, until you see the purification, which is by the white thread-like or by the stoppage of the bleeding. The following hadith, hadith number 122. <clears throat> Narrated Anas radiallahu anhu, the Jews used not to eat with a woman during her menstruation period. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do everything else apart from sexual intercourse with your wives. Now, again, if you've noticed, our religion is based on so many things that we differ with the other religions. Even in the clothes we wear, even the, uh, the, our appearances. You know, growing the beard, the Prophet says, والسلام, grow your beards and uh, uh, cut short your mustaches, differ than the Jews, Christians, and the uh, fire worshippers. But, uh, I mean, this time, we can see the Jew, I mean, the Hebrew people, they, they just like us, they just like Muslim. I mean, not, not the way they're wearing the clothes, but you can see, you know, they, they, have, they have a lot of lihya. Beards. Yeah. Well, this, this is difficult. not the general case. Now, if you look at the population, you would find that it is not the mm. case. Only those rabbis and the student of knowledge may do this. And the beard itself is the sunnah of all prophets of Allah. It's even, it's even mentioned in the Holy Quran when Moses came back, may peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, uh, and he got the tablets with him, and he came and found that his tribe were worshipping this golden uh, uh, cow or whatever. He as we mentioned in the Quran, he started blaming Aaron, his brother. I think I'm pronouncing him right, huh? Aaron. Yeah. And it tells us in the Quran that Aaron said, O oh brother Moses, do not hold me from my head and from my beard. And this is the sunnah, and this is the way of all messengers of Allah. And this is nature, human nature. Men, by nature, should grow beard. This is natural. And it's, it's, it's a strange thing that Allah did not tell us to do something so that we would complain and say, oh, it's too difficult for us to do. He told us just leave it. Now imagine if Allah in the Quran tells us, you have to shave your beards every single morning and in the afternoon. Who would have complied with this? A lot of people would complain and say, God, this is too much. Twice a day or once a day, this is too much. Man, I, I feel like leaving it. I don't want to do this. It's, it's a burden on me. Allah Azza wa on the contrary, is telling you, leave it. So Satan, shaitan, uh, Satan comes and Shaitan, the devil comes to you and says, leave it. Why? Do some effort. Move it. Remove it. And do this and do that. <clears throat> when the Prophet ﷺ told us to differ from the Jews and the Christians and to grow our beards, because the majority of Jews and Christians don't go to the beat. And this is what, what, what you can see. Only those who are 
uh, 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 rabbis and, and students of knowledge and extremists from the Jews grow their beads. But the 99% do not do this. So even if they do this, now even if 100% the Jews and Christians grow their beard, this doesn't mean that we have to differ to them and, and, and shave it. It's not, it's, it, it, imagine that you get this uh, rabbi uh, 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 praying five times a day in the direction of Kaaba. Would we say what? We have to differ with them and okay, if they're praying, I'm not going to pray. No, it's not the case. The prophet is giving us a short uh, uh, justification. You have to do this and maybe it would make you feel better to know that you are different to them. And, but not all the time. So, in, there are so many things in Islam where Allah Azza tells us that you have to be different than the Jews and the Christians. For example, we uh, uh, pray wearing our sandals or without. The Prophet Sallallahu tells us that pray in your sandals because the Jews do not pray in their sandals. So you have the option. If you want, if you're, you're, praying, in, uh, you're, you're praying outdoors, pray wearing your sandals or your shoes. It's okay as long as it has not, no, no filth or dirt on it. Okay. But it doesn't mean, again, to go into the mosque wearing your sandals or boots and praying in the first row because people will not accept this. So we have to be different to the Jews. This hadith tells us that at the time of the Prophet wasalam, and it says that the Jews used, uh, uh, used not to eat with women during their menstruation. So whenever a woman has her menstruation, they would kick her out. Go out for a week or two, come back later on. I don't want to see you. They don't eat with her. They don't touch her. They, they think that she is a menace. I know that some Muslims <laughs> share this unfortunate, uh, wrong concept, and they think that women are menace. But they're not menace, as uh, the case with men. Not all men are menace also. There are good and bad. Nevertheless, <clears throat> uh, uh, they did not eat with her. And they did not sleep in the same bed with her. Because they thought the minute she has the menstruation, she's an evil thing. She has to be uh, uh, thrown away. In Islam, it's a religion of uh, 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 medium. It's in the middle. We don't go to the far extreme to the right or to the far extreme to the left. The Jews are away from their wives when they have the menstruation. The Christians don't, get, don't care if she's menstruating or not. They have intercourse as if nothing is wrong with that. Islam no, fixed this thing and made things right on the right path. We will take a short break, and inshallah, after it, we will continue our topic. <laughs> on the straight path we would like to discuss the niqab from an Islamic and social political perspective. Mm -hmm. So sometimes some non-Muslims they might not understand the full Islamic pictures. Anyone can say anything about it. Yes. So when can we, who speaks for Islam? Mm -hmm. This is the biggest question. <laughs> who speaks for Islam? Mm -hmm. No they are not sinning, they are not sinning but we are talking about now the general ruling. Mm -hmm. They are not sinning but they are going against what has been established. It is his own ishtihad at a specific time. People would see it as a um, threat. A threat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we explain to them it's not really a threat, it's as actually good for the country as well. But if we don't participate, how would we ever reach to our rights? Can you clarify with us what should be the level of political participation of the Muslims in the West? Yeah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Uh, I think we should uh, read hadith 122 and also we should hear hadith 123 afterwards and then comment on both hadith inshallah. Brother Mustafa? Narrated Anas radiallahu anhu, the Jews used not to eat with a woman during her menstruation period. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do everything else apart from sexual intercourse with your wives. 
Okay, and the following hadith. Narrated Aisha, radiallahu anha, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to order me to put on an izar and then caress me while menstruating. Okay, uh, these two hadiths tell us what we're suppo- we, we are allowed to do and we, what we are not allowed to do. For example, Hadith Anas tells us that the Jews used to uh, 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 abandon their wives, used to uh, put them in isolation and stay away as far as possible from them when they are in their menstruation. We know that the Christians don't have anything regarding purity in their religion, in the sense that they don't have to wash, they don't have to clean, they don't have to perform ablution before praying or doing anything. So the, the menstruation is considered nothing to them, so they have no problem in intercoursing while a, a woman is in her menstruation. In Islam, it's uh, in the middle, between these two extremes. In Islam, the only thing that a man is prevented to do with his wife when she is menstruating is intercourse. But other than that, any form of intimacy, uh, any form of playing with his wife and, 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 and feelings and, 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 uh, and rubbing uh, uh, is, is okay, is acceptable. And it shows us that the problem, see, the relationship is not only intercourse. And this is very unfortunate. A lot of people think that the relation between a man and his wife is only intercourse. So if she's menstruating, then uh, dump her and do whatever you want, you know, outdoors or travel or whatever, because she's out of order. She, her expiry date is seven days. Then afterwards, you may refresh the web page and go back again to normal. This is wrong. The Prophet, ﷺ, when his wife would get her monthly period, Nothing would change. On the contrary, he would come close to her, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he will, would make her feel wanted. Though he has alternatives. He has eight other wives. But the feeling itself is good. And this is an advice to all husbands, that when your wife is in her menstruation period, she feel that she is missing something. And by you staying away from her, you're... You're emphasizing this feeling. On the contrary, you should do what the Prophet ﷺ used to do. You should get closer to her. You should give her more love and caring in this short period of time because she needs it uh, a lot. The Jews used to consider uh, uh, a menstruating woman as filth that should be avoided. They should, could, used to consider her body, her clothings, uh, uh, as in, an impurity, a najasa. So they would not sit with her, they would not talk with her, they would not even eat with her. And uh, the Muslims are completely opposite to this. They treat their wives, their daughters, as n- normal as they usually do. The Prophet sallallahu uh, alaihi wasallam, as in the hadith of Aisha, used to uh, kiss her and caress her and and play with her sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Though she was in her menstruation, but he, he did everything except for the intercourse. And the Prophet ﷺ used to put his head in her lap and he used to recite the Qur'an. And this shows you the amount of love between him and her and his, all of his wives. Because the affection has to be there. It's not a physical thing. It's not a, 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 something that one detaches from. She is your wife, she's part of you, and you're part of her. The Prophet ﷺ used to let her comb his hair. And I know a lot of rough, tough men that won't won't allow uh, uh, their women to get close to them. And this is wrong. The Prophet is the perfect man. And he used to have his wife, allow his wife to comb his hair and uh, do everything else as normal. It's, there's no problem of, uh, in a woman having her menstruation. This is a natural thing. It's not a curse. It's not a disease. It is something that is natural and it happens to every uh, uh, one that is female, not male, because you have a problem then. Uh, hadith uh, 124. Narrated Ibn Abbas, 
radiyallahu anhuma, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, regarding a husband who has sexual intercourse with his wife during menstruation period, he should give out one dinar or half a dinar in charity. He should get one dinar or half a dinar, half a, a, a dinar as alms or to charity. Now this hadith tells us about what a person does if he sins. What would he do in order to compensate for his sin? Because if a person sleeps with his wife, intercourses with his wife, while she has a menstruation, this is a sin. It's mentioned in the Holy Quran that you should refrain from intercourse with a menstruation wife. This is not allowed in Islam. But Allah Azza wa knows that people could get weak and shaitan could get strong. So what would happen if a person fell in this sin and committed it? The Prophet here says that he should pay uh, or give out one dinar or half a dinar. So which one to choose? Now, what is a dinar? A dinar is a currency. The, uh, a scholar say it is equivalent to four and a half grams of gold. Four and a half grams of gold. So depending on how much a gram is, you can calculate what you should uh, uh, pay. Uh, uh, intercoursing your wife while she's menstruating is a major sin. It's, it's forbidden and it's haram. Because Allah tells us so, uh, so, and because also of the medical implication on both parties, on both the woman and on the man. And lots of diseases are transmitted through this vulnerable state the woman is in. That is why it's forbidden. But now let's come to a dinar or half a dinar. So which is which? Does anybody have any idea? Which, which one to choose, a dinar or half a dinar? <clears throat> I didn't think so. Probably you're not married yet, so you don't even... Ah, uh, Mustafa. I could guess that maybe if uh, a person did it on purpose, then he pays one dinar. Okay. But if he was tempted, then he gives half a dinar. Well, purpose and tempted is the same thing, because if you're tempted and you do it, then you will be punished for it. See, if a person... Or he didn't know. He didn't know, well, if he didn't know, then there's nothing wrong in that because Allah says in the Quran, if we have done it by forgetfulness or we did not know, then Allah will not hold us responsible for it. Now, temptation is found everywhere. And if you're tempted and you answer your call of temptation, you're sinful and you're punished accordingly. But scholars say, dinar, and half a dinar, depending on when this intercourse takes place. So let's imagine that a person is sleeping with his wife, she's pure, he has 22 or 23 days of tahara, of, he's okay, they're sleeping off and on, it's okay. Then, today he's, he had intercourse with her, tomorrow she has her menstruation. If he makes intercourse this day, he should pay one full dinar. Why? Because he was enjoying himself the past 23, 22 days. So there's not that big urge and need for intercourse. But if he waits for a whole week, and then he's tempted, and he, then he falls into sin and, uh, commit, uh, and, and has intercourse, then he pays only half a dinar. Why? Because the need is much far greater than it was a week ago. You see the catch? It's different depending on the need. If it, the need was not there, then he should be punished more. But if the need is there, though it's a sin, though it's haram, yet he was tempted and he did it. So the compensation would be paying uh, 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 this half dinar. Uh, the following uh, hadith, hadith number 125, Narrated by Abu Sa'id Al Khudri. Abu Sa'id Al Khudri. Abu Sa Abu Sa'id Al Khudri. And by the way, Sa'id means happy. So you should be happy when you are reading this hadith. 
Okay. Radiallahu anhu. Allah Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Is it not the case that a woman in her menstruation period neither pray nor, nor fast? Of course, this is a part of a very long hadith. But what do we learn from this hadith? Simple. A menstruating woman does not fast and does not pray. So this is as simple as it gets. And I don't think we have to elaborate more on uh, uh, this hadith. But what happens if a woman fasts without knowing? And this w happens with lots of the girls when they're young and they're not uh, uh, adult yet. So a girl is about 9, 10 years, 11 years old, and all of a sudden, boom, she gets her menstruation. <clears throat> so she's shy. She doesn't tell her father. She doesn't tell her mother. And she goes by. And she prays with her mother, and she fasts Ramadan with them, and she doesn't tell them that she has her menstruation. And six, seven, ten, fifteen years later, she realizes that this was wrong. So she asks, what should I do? Well, the answer is typical and easy. The prayers are unacceptable, and she don't have to pray them again as they do, they are not requ uh, required to be prayed again. A menstruating woman does not pray, period. And when she's clean, she does not uh, uh, pray them again. But uh, uh, the fasting of Ramadan is a different story. She has to fast these days again. So if she is asking 10 years after the event took place, she has to calculate. How many Ramadans did you skip? Usually it's two or three Ramadans because two or three years and then everybody knows that she's a grown-up woman now. So she, it's a two or three uh, uh, months. Then how many days do you calculate? She says, well, usually it's six days to seven days. So let's assume seven days. By three, you have 21 days to make up for the days that you have fasted when you had your menstruation, which you were not supposed to do. Okay, am I, am I sinful by doing this? Yes, you are sinful. Allah Azza wa will forgive you if you repent. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. So until we meet next time, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.